coming out tonight, and uh, thanks for giving me my uh, two favorite words. So now. Oh, yeah. Roll on, 
Oh, hello, DMV. Welcome to Living on Music. I am Steve Houck, and so happy that uh, that you have joined us uh, tonight for what I think is <clears throat> one of the most special shows that I could probably ever do on ZTV and for Living on Music. And it is, well, you see behind me where I am. I wish I was there, actually. I'm so used to this this wall and, and kind of the uh, the environment in and around this amazing place, which, of course, is the Birchmere. And we are uh, graced and extremely, extremely lucky to be able to have an evening of conversation with Gary Olsey, the uh, founder and current operator and owner um, of the Birchmere, uh, the legend who began the whole ride, um, as well as Michael Jaworik, who is a VIP, uh, VP booker extraordinaire promoter of the Birchmare and is one of the reasons that they have grown uh, over the last 20 some years uh, since Michael arrived, I guess 33 years actually is the, is the uh, amount. But we are going to have an amazing conversation. We're gonna look back, we're gonna look present, we're gonna look future at this amazing place. I mean, I, I, I love it. And you'll hear a little bit more about that in a little while tonight. Um, Sam Fish, Samantha Fish is playing at the Birchmere. So again, they've opened uh, limited seating, about 200 people, about 40 percent of the of the um, uh, venue is it can be filled right now by, per the regulations. So Samantha Fish is playing there tonight. What a phenomenal blues player she is. And you'll see a little bit of her music coming up in a, a couple uh, a clip from uh, from the history of the Birchmere here. Free flowing musical experience. Oh, man, those guys. Um, I just I, I think they're wonderful. Um, they, Scott and Greg just do a beautiful job. Uh, John David Coppola is, uh, uh, you know, sits in with them obviously too sometimes. And, and also, you know, is a, a huge push of them from Alexandria live. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, and they'll be there on October 24th. Um, Tom Paxton is playing the next day and I've interviewed Tom. He's a buddy and, and that's amazing. He's a legend, complete legend. And, um, uh, on November 20th, Bobby Thompson is going to be there and bobby is going to be my guest on living on music next monday very very excited we've talked a little bit about him him and his life and how and our show and how wonderful it is to have bobby thompson on i, I he's a, a really really um high-end talent blues rock folk just a fabulous guy so he's on monday and he'll be playing the Birchmere on november 20th and on november 27th is seldom seen um and you'll hear a little bit of the history of seldom seen in the Birchmere, who basically grew together um, as their, their, their popularity was evolving in this area and I have some really um, neat anecdotes from Gary and, and Michael on those guys. Um, we want to, uh, speaking of venues, um, we want to start out again as I do every show with hashtag Save Our Stages. Uh, it is NIVA, it is the National Independent Venue Association. Um, NIVA is um, really trying very, very hard to push for Congress to pass the Save Our Stages Act. And we've all talked about it, all of us who are associated with music, in music, all these people. And basically, um, venues are gonna cross the country are gonna, are gonna shut down unless that comes through. Um, so many already have, as we know, around here, Union Jacks, uh, other places that we know and love. Um, that's why also your donation to NIVA's Emergency Relief Fund is really important. Um, you know, it, it, fans have been generous Donations are coming in. People are really trying to help. The big deal is getting the getting the Congress to pass the Relief Act. But but if you can donate, go to hashtag Save Our Stages, sign the petition. It takes two minutes or less. And then also, if you if you got 20 bucks or something, throw it into the emergency relief fund. There are 3000 independent venues, you guys, that are um, in NIVA and 90 percent of them are in jeopardy of closing. So you know, it is it is amazing. There was an amazing show this weekend um, called the Save Our Stages Fest. I promoted it Monday, my 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 last show on Monday with Soul Roots. And it's an amazing show. And you can go to um, YouTube Music and go to Save Our Stages and find it and, and listen, watch these guys. It's Foo Fighters. It's Jason Mraz. It's Reba McIntyre, um, Portugal of the Man, all this different cross section of music, some amazing people. And Brooke, um, Brittany Howard from, from Alabama Shakes. So go check that out. But please, please, please um, go to NIVA, uh, go to Save Our Stages. Um, right now, again, you can donate. It benefits um, um, so many people. Two million letters have been sent um, to Congress through NIVA for Save Our Stages. So please jump on that if you haven't yet. Also, locally, the After Dark Fund, uh, which was start, started by my fellow media, uh, local media guy, um, Mark Seagraves. He started the After Dark Fund to really help musicians um, you know, 
get through. Um, and it, it really is a, uh, it's a kind of a shared responsibility if you go on there and you, you can see some of the bands that are playing, you can see the people who are active out there, but also you can, you can donate and you'll get a really, there's some really cool shirts. It's like, I love live music after dark fund. Uh, there's some other little quips on shirts, but those guys are really amazing. And Mark's been, you know, d done a great job getting that going. So after dark fund on Facebook, it's easy to find and you can check it out, bookmark it, and then go back and help them if you can. Um, what I like to do uh, every week now is thank um, my previous guests, uh, a couple of them each show and plug what they're doing because these people are amazing. I mean, the, the level of local talent and also now international and national talent that we've been able to, to grab through through this pandemic because people are either want to do it or they're a little bit hibernating. And it's an interesting it's an interesting scenario. But we've tried to help musicians uh, get out, engage, market themselves, play music, laugh tell stories about their lives. It's been a great run. One guy, Eric Scott, one of my favorite musicians in this area and a real sweet guy who, I've, who I have sang um, at um, uh, gigs with, with Ron Neumeier's Bandhouse gigs and things. This guy is one of the great talents this area has ever seen. And he wants to say hello to the Peace Bombers because this is a very exciting week for Eric. He's going to be releasing the new single and video for Peace Bomb, which he played on my show. And you can go to the Zebra and search Eric Scott or go to videos and find the show we did about three months ago. Um, this Friday, October 23rd. So you go to Eric Scott Music on Facebook and you can pre-save a link. It's really easy. And basically you pre-save the single. So uh, you'll be alerted the moment it becomes available for download and streaming. Help these people out, you guys. Eric is a fantastic musician. He was on a roll with the Charm City Sessions record. You know, was nominated for nine whammies. This is an amazing guy, and he deserves your support. And his music rocks. So go to Eric Scott Music um, and and do the Peace Bomb thing for him. It's a it's a great great song, and it's going to be great great music coming in from him for a long time as it is. Um, another musician I I, I adore is Siobhan O'Brien. Siobhan O'Brien is releasing. Uh, a cover of one of the great Patti Smith songs that I've ever heard. And I love Patti to, just to death. She's such a fabulous artist. Um, her book, if you haven't read it, is, is spectacular. Um, the, the art you see here was done by, um, by uh, Siobhan's niece, um, she, who has been doing some artwork because she's, she's a graphic artist and has been doing beautiful stuff. I mean, I just, you know, I just totally you know, love that. And it's People Have the Power. It came out in 1988. Um, it's been a kind of a history of her music. Um, and um, Siobhan does a fabulous cover of it. Um, it's just, it's a, everything Siobhan does is gold. Um, she has a new record. Go to Siobhan O'Brien. And again, it's S-I-O-B-H-A-N, pronounced Siobhan. Uh, it's the Irish in her. Um, and that's, um, that's where you would find her music. And you can go on and you can also do a... Um, a pre-save on her single uh, version of this. You know, guys, it doesn't take a lot of effort. It doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of anything, but it goes a huge way if you get out there and support local music right now. And people like Eric and Siobhan and all these amazing musicians I've had on um, really could use your support. Um, before we delve into the world of the Birchmere, and I'm telling you, this is a blissful show for me, being such a fan of the Birchmere, being such a part of their organization as far as a press guy. Love them so much, and this is going to be a lot of fun. So hold, um, buckle up your seatbelt and get ready to go down the history lane with uh, with the Birchmere. Uh, before that, we're going to roll uh, a little bit of uh, video of Siobhan doing People Have the Power. And again, go to her website, go to Eric's, support local music, and support the Birchmere when you can get out there and you feel safe. Um, the Birchmere is open. Again, Sam Fish tonight. Here's a little Siobhan O'Brien, and then we're going to go to the Birchmere. Well, about oh, maybe 15 or so years ago, um, as the music writing part of my life took shape, I, I became somewhat of a regular at the place you see behind me, uh, where I have stood many a gig, 
um, uh, to wait to get into the place and then also uh, as press to be able to come at five o'clock and go in. Um, the one and the only Birchmere. Um, I remember one of my guests tonight saying that I should just have a cot in the back um, room since I'm coming so often. Um, subsequently, over the last decade or two, the Birchmere has become one of my very favorite and most treasured places on earth, um, as it is for so many people. Uh, thanks to another one of my guests tonight, I was able to secure interviews with many amazing musicians. That was my in as a writer um, to help promote the gigs, um, but through the artists PR folks, I was not only able to interview these people, but I got to meet and even hang out a bit with some of uh, them in the back of the Birchmere famed Birchmere Green Room. Um, I, I mean, true heroes of mine, you guys, like Peter Frampton, got to hang out in the alley behind for 10 minutes and talk to him, which was one of the great thrills of my life. David Crosby a couple of times, um, Steve Earle, John Hyatt. I remember at Richard Thompson's show, I got to meet him afterwards, which was a major thrill, been a lifelong fan. But before the gig, I got a call from Gordon Lightfoot's PR agent that said he can do the interview today. And then after that, we don't know when he's going to be able to do one. He was approaching 90 and they had really tried to get stuff in. So Gary and those guys let me sit back in the VIP room off the flex stage room by myself to interview Gordon Lightfoot. Um, and, and what a tr tremendous thrill that was talking to him for 30 minutes. So that was another Birchmere memory. Um, other people like Suzanne Vega, Ann Wilson, Southside Johnny, one of my childhood heroes, even Herb Alpert, who I listened to as a child with my parents playing his music all the time in my house in Connecticut. Um, a huge highlight of the night of a night at the Birchmere is when you walk in the door and you go over to the bar area and out comes Gary Olsey, one of my guests tonight, um, the founder, owner and operator of the Birchmere, uh, smiles abound uh, with a hearty handshake and a hello. He does it with so many people who show up as well. And it, it's right then when you know that the journey of that night's gig has begun. And also a, a greeting that I got all the time going to the show that I always look forward to is the amazing John Brinegar, the GM of the Birchmere, who runs a huge part of the operational um, part of the club and is always there with a hug and a how you doing. Um, in some ways, it's like family. Um, the relationship I've been able to foster personally with this incredible place, as well as a lot of other people, has been a highlight of my life, and I hope it will continue to be. Um, in the mid-60s, I think it was around April of 1966, Gary Olsey purchased a restaurant in South Arlington called The Birchmere, um, started to help run it, and then ended up owning it. Um, legend tells that this Kentuckian wasn't necessarily a champion of music, at least he wasn't going to be in, in the music business. I, he even said it was the farthest thing from his mind. But as things progressed early on, he realized at the time that there were, at first, a slew of bluegrass bands out there, and they they needed some exposure. So he was able to work some things in with a band, with bands like The Seldom Seen and become equally growing in their awareness in the area, those those two. Um, it, it's, it's funny because the or, the original sounds of the, of the Birchmere continue, the bluegrass, the folk, but it's become an astonishing roster of multi-genre artists that come to the Birchmere, and many are dear friends. And we're talking about all the people I mentioned, as well as others like Linda Ronstadt, Jerry Jeff Walker, Lyle Lovett, Mary Chapin Carpenter, on and on and on. Heck, there's even a book coming out about the Birchmere, and we'll talk to Gary about that as well. But make, make no mistake, uh, as many of you know, the Birchmere is a beloved place. It's re revered not only in the D.C. area, but nationwide as really one of the great music venues anywhere. And that is due in large part to not only to the team that is in the Birchmere, but my two guests tonight who are right now, as you will see in a moment, sitting inside unmistakably that incredible hallway of posters at the Birchmere. And I could not ask for more utter bliss than to have them there. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome original Birchmere founder, owner, operator, pioneer Gary Olsey and longtime booking guru and master promoter and my personal liaison for a long time. Michael Jaworek. Yeah, such a joy to see you guys. How are you? Great, we're great, great. Glad to be here. Uh, I'm so glad to uh, to actually be in that room. I mean, even though I'm obviously virtual, like all of us on Earth, uh, it, it feels so great to see both of you guys and in that hallway. Um, how are you doing? I, I think, first of all, I'd like to know how you're doing personally. This has been a crazy time, trying to figure out everything and trying to rejigger our lives. Um, Gary, I'll start with you. How you feeling? How you doing? Uh, have you have you found any new hobbies at home? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, worrying. It's called uh, anxiety, uh, boredom, 
it, so right. whatever. Right. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. we finally got open in uh, July, uh, just on the weekends, and uh, it's, it, it, it's taken off very slow because um, a lot of, well, we had to move the schedule. Michael moved the schedule backwards four or five different times. It was unbelievable. Right. Nobody in right. the beginning thought it was going to be this long. And uh, so that's where we, I made a few bad decisions, you know, borrowing uh, this free money from the government. But uh, I, right. should, I should know nothing's free. Uh, but, right. Uh, is it feel a little? In, does it feel a little interesting? Obviously, to have the limited seating, and and you know, how is that? What has that felt like, you guys, to have that going? Well, it, it it's it, it's really hard hard on us, uh, but we're making sure that we obey all the rules and things written down, and we even go a step further. We got a guy that comes in with a atomizer or something that fogs a place like they do uh, hospitals and. Uh, old folks homes, things like that. We've, we've, right. We're maintaining plenty of safety. Uh, a lot of people are still scared to come out. Some shows we do very well on, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really, really hard. Um, it, it's hard for me to get Michael to understand. Michael, uh, we only have half the seating we used to, you know? Right. Have, right. Which means we can right. only huh? pay half of what we used to, you know, that kind right. of thing. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's the that's the bear of the of the fight right now. Michael, how's it been dealing with bands who are scrambling to play at you know wanting full houses? How, how's that process? Well, gone? it's it's varied. Uh, some artists are very accommodating. Understand that uh, the old line about we came over on different ships, but we're in the same boat now holds, and realize that we're working at forty percent capacity, and. We try to figure out deals whereby it can be financially viable for both parties. Uh, there are some where they set, <clears throat> pardon me, where they feel they cannot afford to take the date. Uh, I don't get into an argument with them because this is all such a, a personal choice now. There are some artists who right. will, uh, out of the limited number who are touring, there are some who at this point uh, are afraid to play indoors. But uh, I would say that seems to be loosening up as time has gone on, as it's getting colder, and the option of playing outdoors for some of these drive-in situations has diminished as it gets colder. Right. And of course, as people need income. So uh, I, I think in the main, uh, those artists who are willing to work understand the situation. There's no animosity going on in that regard, right. the way there sometimes right. is in negotiations. Yeah, I can't imagine the, um, there's any you know, um, loss of the reputation of, of your amazing organization there. And that's what's beautiful. That has been something that has sustained over the, over the you know, course of time. Um, Gary, we're going to talk a little about the book that's coming out next year, but I wanted to take you back as a Kentuckian coming in and buying a place in Arlington. How did that evolve? Why, why, why did you come to Arlington? Did you live here? And then did, how did you buy the first Birchmere? Well, the, um, the, uh, I got out of the service in 63, uh, went to work for people's drug stores, if you remember them. And, yeah. and uh, there was a, a gentleman whose kid uh, uh, worked for me. And he, and he would come by to pick him up after work and we'd sit down and have a cup of coffee. And he said, I just uh, bought a bought a restaurant called the Birchmere. It's about a year old place, and the guy wants out of it. And he said, wow. uh, "I'll give you some stock, and you run it for me, and uh, stock options." And uh, I we came to a deal. I said, "Okay, I'll run the place." And uh, it was right behind Sherlington. In those days, Sherlington didn't have any restaurants and things, so we had a great uh, uh, lunch business. But in the evenings, it was it was pretty slow. So um, I started with uh, putting in a, a something on a little bit of music on uh, Wednesday night and Saturday night, and and I never right. envisioned the Birchmere. If I'd ever visioned this, it would have probably never happened. <laughs> it was all right. a, a step at a time, and this is the third third uh, incarnation here. So. 
But now, and, that, and then so bluegrass became kind of a, a staple of the of the original Birchmere, and that was something that you you kind of did on purpose because you saw a lot of bluegrass musicians around this area that maybe needed a little bit of awareness as well as coming into contact with seldom seen. Well, the uh, bluegrass was very popular here at that time. I wasn't a bluegrass uh, fan. I mean, I, I like right. all music. I didn't mean I didn't like the music, but I wasn't a, a devoted fan. In fact, it, it's pretty. It was a pretty closed club then. I I had a lot of trouble getting into the business because uh, bluegrass people in those days thought the pie was only so big, and and uh, what was I doing sticking my nose in it? So right. there were about a there were about six or eight clubs playing bluegrass music, and uh, right. I would go see these bands and the clubs, and uh, they would. Uh, they, I mean, they were they were joints. I mean, uh, they'd have a TV on on the bar. They'd have a bowling machine and uh, and uh, you know the, all this talking. It was more of a party then. And I thought, man, there's people here who want to hear this music. And right, I, right. You know, I was a big fan of the uh, cellar door. So I right. st I stole their. Uh, they had a little quiet sign on the table, and I stole that. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and had it printed up and. You know, and it said in deference to the audience, and it took me a long time to figure out what in deference meant. But um, right. <laughs> I uh, I started uh, putting in bluegrass groups and uh, asking people to be quiet. And oh, God, and I it love worked. That. And it worked. Yeah, and, I, I heard you. I heard you got rid of half the crowd one night. Oh yes, it was, we had a, <laughs> I love that story. Had a snowstorm, and there was about thirty people there. And they thought, oh boy, we'll have a party. And uh, we ended up, uh, Moose and I, the original door for a person, we asked about half of them to leave, you know. And oh, we've, that's we've stuck to, to it religiously. Um, we're okay. a dinosaur now. There, there became a lot of good listening clubs, and there were some good clubs back then. The cellar door, like I said, you could go to the Child Herald and, and a few others, Michael, right? you remember those clubs. That, but, um, yeah, absolutely. So I became well, we, a, a bluegrass club without even knowing it. Um, I went up, he used to go up the old Red Fox and see the seldom seen. Became friends with uh, Mike Aldridge and right. uh, talked John Duffy into coming down, playing the club. They played a couple Saturday nights and then I talked him into playing every other Thursday. And then I made him a deal I said, uh, I think we were we were getting uh, four dollars at cover charge. I believe is what it was. Right. So I said, right. to, I said to Duffy, uh, I'll give you eight hundred dollars a night. And he said, How are you going to do that? And I said, Well, it's four dollars to get in. I guess uh, you know. I guess we go to eight dollars. And he said, It'll <laughs> never work. It'll never work. And well, they sold out for twenty years. So. Oh well, yeah, they sure did. We've got a, I've got a, an amazing clip I dug up um, of uh, walking through the front door of that, of that place. Um, I think it might have been the, 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 it was the first Birchmere. Let's take a little bit of a look. Let's walk into the Birchmere and hear a little of that original, seldom seen. <laughs> Live from the Birchmere, the seldom seen and special guest Brian Bowers. <laughs> That clip was the uh, the shot for WETA. That was the first live show they ever did outside of the studio. Oh, and, that's fantastic! Yes. Yeah, it, I had no I, I had no idea that was it. Well, WETA yeah. yeah WETA was in Charlington and then and all the guys that's I right. knew 
I knew them all from lunchtime and such, and uh, it was their idea, but that was the first live show WETA ever did outside of that studio. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Michael, you, um, you know, you're talking about bluegrass being an original kind of expression, but it, you know, it, it, it was a natural growth to evolve into other music, I would think, as a music club. Well, when I approached Gary uh, out of the blue in 1988 to book the club, I told him I thought I could both uh, increase and diversify his bookings, that the venue was set up not unlike the old cellar door as a concert club where um, <clears throat> all sorts of artists could play there. It could be blues one night, jazz the next, R&B, folk, whatever was appropriate for the geography of the room. And, right. uh, but I, I also knew that organic growth would be the firmest and the best way. So starting with bluegrass and folk, which we had in the room already, we sort of expanded like the concentric circles in a pool of water when you drop the rock to move right. out to say country rock and then country or from say um, uh, a fusion jazz to the more R&B type jazz and then straight R&B. So by doing this gradually we were able to extend, expand the audience in a, uh, in a organic, natural and firm way and thus now our email list is in excess of 150,000 people. Uh, that's, yeah, and the, the genres, as I look at your schedule over the years, the genres are just wonderfully across the board. I know that the club uh, moved on to, um, um, it moved on to Mount Vernon Avenue in, in 1981. You, you began to continue and evolve your, your sound and your, your bookings. And you had this one guy come in and play a lot named Danny Gatton. And Danny's a, a local legend. Uh, any anecdotes about Danny and his presence uh, at the Birchmere? I know we do. Dave and T Tom and the gang do the tributes to Roy and, and Danny now at your at your place. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit about Danny Gatton at the Birchmere? Uh, fun nights. Uh, great, you know, Danny, great guy. Uh, I love to talk old cars. In fact, he, he and his brother were rebuilding a 49 Mercury for me. Uh, oh, wow. At, at the time. Uh, I think Danny liked cars better than old cars, better than music. Uh, his uh, right. very last album was recorded at the Birchmere, and oh, uh, that's fantastic. That, you know that's a fond memory of mine. You know, I once uh, I ran sound on the original club for about 30, the first thirty years, and uh, right. Well, I remember once I asked Danny. I don't know where I got why I did it, but I said, Danny, can't you turn it down just just a little bit? And you know, he explained something to me that I learned in a lesson in life was, uh, but he said, Gary, I can't get, I can't get the tone, I can't get what I want to hear, and but you know what? He turned the, uh, he turned the amp around, facing the back of the stage, and because uh, the first chair was a very small, small room, that second one, and right. if that amp was hit, was was hitting you in the head, I mean, you. Yeah. But um, well, anyway, so one yeah, time yeah. we got a phone call from someone who said, "I'm really right. enjoying the show," and I now this is before the days of cell phones, so I didn't know what the person meant. She said, "Yes, I live across the street. Mr. Ganton is a tremendous guitar player." Uh, I said, "Ma'am, I hope you're not going to call the police." Oh no, no, no! I just wanted to tell you how wonderful it sounded. <laughs> oh, I love that. Well, you know what? We've got a, a clip of Danny. 1988, uh, so it's the year that, Michael, you joined, um, uh, I think right around the time of this clip. This is Danny Gatton at the second Birchmere location, ripping it up. I bet the neighbors heard it across the street. Let's check this out. <laughs> to our, our good fortune that the cellar door closed then. So right. they, uh, you know, they were doing cellar door production, so they would take Gordon Lightfoot and whoever and go to Constitution Hall 
but they forgot all right. about a lot of talented people like Tom Rush or Tom Paxton and and uh, yeah. Ian Tyson and these guys that would come in there and play a week, but they didn't want to put them in the big halls. And uh, uh, we jumped all over that. I mean, uh, right? Yeah. So and, and you and, and you continue to be somebody who 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 enjoys the sit down concert environment, which the Birchmere thrives on. Oh, I, I, I couldn't I'd run, run it the other way. I mean, when we moved into this building, we do have a stand-up room, but I, it really bugs me. <laughs> it's, it's, right. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, it, it's a, it's a, the Birchmere is a dinosaur. There used to be a lot of great, you know, I used to love the, the, the music hall in San Francisco, up in New York, the bottom line, and then, and the Ark and uh, up in Miss, where were they up? Ann in, Arbor. Ann Arbor and right, they, exactly. They, they, well, it may know. be it may be a dinosaur, but the dinosaurs are like Jurassic Park. They're they're as modern as anything. You guys are still the quintessential place. Uh, there's some some great moments that that I was able to kind of dig up, and and you can elaborate on them as we go a little bit. I, I know that some of the last gigs played by people like Ray Charles were at the Birchmere, and these guys were legends. They did some of their last gigs there, and so did Glenn Campbell. Um, and do you have, have any any anecdotes about whenever Glenn played? Did he play before often, or was this oh, a had, relative he, rarity? He had played before. Um, a real fun guy. He loved to tell uh, Roger Miller stories. And, oh, I love Roger <laughs> Miller. Yeah, and, king of the king of the road. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a Roger Miller story. Uh, I, well, let's talk about Glenn. You know, I mean, toward the end right. there. We, uh, I think we played him three times, three times, yeah. three times on the last tour. Um, you know, it was, we, we had no idea that he was uh, as sick as he was. Um, right. He, he hardly, uh, the, his kids were wonderful and very sweet. And uh, they were in the band also. They were, they were in the right. band and yes. whatever, and they would, they would help him with things. But uh, yeah, he, but he, Played phenomenal. I mean, but the he, sure did. he would get into a break though, and he'd forget what he was doing, and he'd just keep on. And you know, they they go over and they'd slap him on the back. <laughs> right. Hey, Dad. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it was tough to watch, but boy, uh, he still there was still some solid moments. We've got one to show real quick. It's uh, a little bit of Glenn Campbell's last show here at the Birchmere, and one of his last shows ever. A little gentle on my mind. Just knowing that she goes on the ways of her life and goes on the ways of her life. That makes me gently leave my sleeping back row of men stash behind your couch. And it's knowing I'm not shackled by my kind of words and bonds. And the ink stains that are dried upon the summer line. Back roads by the rivers of my memory. It keeps you in the mood and you blow my mind. Wow, uh, that gives me chills. Um, anytime you see him him perform, and again, you're right, his family on stage, um, emotional stuff, and uh, what a documentary about him as well. One one uh, staple of the of the Birch Mirror that I can see is is the blues element that you guys bring in there. Um, you know, there are some amazing people, of course, legends mm -hmm. like Buddy Buddy Guy and such, and then you've got the the younger legends like Tab and Samantha. I'm, um, I've got a, a little clip I wanted to show in a minute of Buddy, but let's uh, talk a little bit about the blues and, and Michael, maybe you can speak to this on how that that has really evolved into another Birchmere kind of big genre. I got involved in concert promotion in Illinois in the early 70s, bringing Chicago blues acts to school where I was at yeah. the University of Illinois. So I was familiar with many of these uh, players that I presented over the oh. years. So it was a natural thing that when I acquired booking the Birchmere with Gary that I would pick up the artists when they would come east. And so wow. in the case of Buddy or the Nighthawks or who of course are based yeah. here or any other number of people, Albert King, even BB King was here twice. Wow. Um, it was Unreal. a joy to see those artists ascend the stage here because that was the music from which my interest in uh, in show business, if you will, uh, spring. Yes. And um, oh. we, we had, I guess, one of the last B.B. King shows when he was he here, uh, for example. Yeah. And it was a joy to I see him be here. 
Well, I love Buddy Guy when he plays the Birchmere, you know, un, unfailingly walks around the room and, you know, all the way to the back of the room. I remember seeing him at a community college when I was about 25 and he walked outside the door into the parking lot in the snow and we were dancing out in the blues with Buddy Guy in the snow. I mean, that's kind of a thing. We're going to watch a clip from a real Waylon solo from Buddy Guy at the Birchmere. <laughs> Yeah, he um, he just has never really lost a lot in his playing. What an amazing guy! There's some modern blues folks, and and another, uh, you, you guys have the Dave Chapels and the Tom Principatos and things like that, and also Tab Ben has been an amazing part of your repertoire. Let's take another blues run before we jump back in here uh, with Tab, Samantha Fish, and Tommy Castro. All that's of a, which, that's a hell all of which, who, all of whom have been here many times. Yeah. Ex Exactly, and that's why they're. Uh, I, I picked the clip because that they they are part of the Birchmere. Uh, let's watch these three go for a minute. film company and uh, it was called Berkeley Photo and they wanted us to look at it because it was empty and sitting and, and they didn't want any uh, uh, industrial uh, uh, people to move in here and um, right. so we made a deal on the uh, building and um, I'll, uh, with uh, Jim Matthews he, he put it all together and I'll explain who Jim Matthews is in the book <laughs> I said that. right but uh, that's what go along but anyway uh, yeah it was it was quite a uh, uh, an adventure but it, we needed the move and uh, I was actually gonna stay on stay on about five more years or whatever and then five years went by and I shook hands with Jimmy and I'm that was I said I'll do another five, and that was 23 years ago. So, oh, God. <laughs> I, you know, ended up hanging out. Ended up hanging out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. that's well, that's yeah. that's spectacular. Um, and, I, and I know you guys have had um, a lot. You know, again, a, a wonderful swath. And I loved reading some of the pre pre research I was doing, Gary, when you and Michael, you too, I'm sure. But Gary talking about singer songwriters being kind of the the you know, the core, uh, the impetus of, of the Birchmere in so many ways. Is that, that continues to be kind of in the back of your minds all the time? Oh yeah, that was part of the reason I did the book or decided to uh, do the book. Um, right. I, I was totally into singer-songwriters and uh, I, I want people to read this book and, and find out 
want to find out who uh, Mickey Newberry is and Towns Van Zandt and Tony Rice yeah. and and uh, I, because there's a there's so much music out there that these kids are, and I well I just mean younger people have no sure. idea. I mean I envy I'd envy them finding one of these acts and and getting into them and and uh, yeah. and listening to the music. I mean we've had some people here that that will never be duplicated. Danny Gatton's one, Danny Gatton's one of them. You'll never see another Danny Gatton. You'll never see another no. Mike Aldridge. You'll never see right. another uh, Tony Rice. You know, you just, uh, it, 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 it's, it's impossible. And it is, and I, one one guy that I that I have revered meeting at the Birchmere, it's been two of the most incredible experiences of my life is David Crosby. And the fact that David not only survived his own health and life, but talk about amazing singer songwriters over the course of the of, of his career and puts on beautiful shows here. I uh, let's take a quick clip, uh, uh, a look at David Crosby doing Triad in 2015 at the Birchmere. All right. You want to know how it will be. Be and her, or you and me. You both sit there with your long heads falling. Your eyes are alive and your minds are still growing. Saying you, you, saying. is to present uh, the new folk who follow in the track of some of the godfathers and godmothers. Uh, one, for example, Sarah Bareilles has now gone on to greater glory on Broadway with um, Waitress sure has. and some other shows yes. and um, a few others. Uh, like uh, Duncan Sheep with Spring Awakening, where he wrote the music for that. And of course, those uh, from Potomac, Maryland, Tori Amos got, did her yeah. first public show here when she had her record deal and went on to great and glory. And you've all, you've, you guys been a constant for the, the Bacon Brothers who have, have turned out to be a, a wonderful music act uh, as, along with Kevin's, you know, very successful movie career. It seems that they're kind of buddies of the Birchmere in some way. They come in every year in the summer when uh, Kevin is on hiatus from whatever TV show or movie he's making. Right. Uh, he has family in the area and they come in for a long weekend and it's uh, very much a, a hometown gig. And both he and his brother Michael, who by the way is a, uh, a well-recognized musician, yes. composer in the documentary and PBS world, uh, but it's always wonderful to see them here. And well, uh, very I'm gonna gracious. roll it. Uh, I've, I found this wonderful clip uh, of one of their songs from back in 2017. And basically, as I said in the pre-meeting, it's a little Birchmere promo reel all of sorts we're going to roll a, a, a minute of this i mean you see the the backgrounds and the and all of the i think you even see the stage door in the back and it's it's a it's a song video so i love this let's roll in a little bacon brothers at the birch mayor golden taxis silver planes camelbacks and sleeper trains tow the line and stay Rented cars and carriage horses How long can we keep this pace? How long must we run this race? Maybe we should let the wheel go Volume down and let it flow Just like two rivers Looking for the sea Rapid raging through the hills Silent when the water stills So close those famous blue eyes Roll along with me Just like two rivers 
Well, that's wonderful. Again, it looks it's like a Bir Birchmere motif in the, in the Bacon Brothers video. Wonderful. Well, you know, um, we're almost out of time, but Gary, I wanted to you know, ask you, you know, I know both you and Michael can answer to this. Um, I know you wanted to get back going. Businesses have to get back going. Everybody's been thinking of you, hoping that v venues like you guys, I mean, I promoted NIVA um, every gig that I uh, show that I've done and save our stages. And I, I, you know, I revere you guys. Talk a little bit about opening in July and what that mindset was. Well, the, the mindset was that uh, I, I've got to keep my crew together. Every one of these guys have been with the Birchmere for 35 or 40 years. I wouldn't be here without it. Michael joined me 40 years ago. How many years? Was uh, 33. And, and, <laughs> but who's counting? But, but that, who's yeah, counting? that's a lot. And uh, I couldn't do without him. It's not about me. It's about it's about us. It's about like you mentioned, John, uh, our, our GM, or or, or okay. Bud, our sound people. Uh, the bands yep. that walk in the back door, they expect that. They expect to see the same guys. They expect to see. They know what they're going to get. They're, that that kind of thing. We're not um, we're not making any money. Uh, I mean, you know, I hope we can break even a little bit towards the end of the year here and and stay. And uh, but but the main reason to open was to um, to keep my guys together. You know, we're a team and uh, my. Uh, Stuart in the box office and my chef. Yeah, and, I love them all. And, oh, it's a cast of, it's a cast of, of wonderful people. Absolutely. Yeah. So that that that's our goal. Uh, uh, we, uh, well, that's just our goal. <laughs> yeah, Michael, uh, what are your what are your thoughts uh, on kind of the how things are going to be turning on this next leg of could, which could go you know, six months into into trying to figure out full well, attendance. Well, we don't know. I mean, we're we are kind of waiting to see what will happen about a month from now, whether the government, uh, federal or state, will allow us to increase or even go back to our original capacity. Right now we're operating at 200, which is 40 percent, and that's larger than almost anybody else uh, within not just yeah. the state, but definitely within the marketplace. It um, is. Yeah. We've had to... Uh, count on regionals, locals, tribute acts, many artists that we perhaps could not play uh, in normal times. But the audiences have come out, folks want to see shows, there's great identification uh, of self by the music. People love like-minded souls, like to herd together. So we've been able to exist. I won't say that we've been doing slamming business, but we've been doing well enough that we've been able to survive. And like Gary said, um, you know, everybody here works hard to make the place work. And it's a, a case where we have people on the staff who've been here for many years, and it's a very well-oiled, coherent machine. Kind of like the Yankees back in '27 with <laughs> Babe Ruth and those guys. But, yeah, way back, way back then. Yeah, right. yeah or the yeah, early yeah. '60s Yankees. But in any event, are you got <clears throat> right? Are you open to any kind of federal stimulus uh, funding, if I may ask? We we did the, that very early on that first Triple R or whatever it was. Uh, but I, I wished I hadn't. Um, I thought it was right. going to be short term. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, I've loaned the Birch Beer the, some money and, and I've sold my boat and I've sold my jet skis and whatever and we'll, wow. be, we'll be here, we'll be fine. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, nobody understands business that, that the Birch Beer has probably taken, already uh, uh, lost about $3 million. Now that doesn't mean that's our $3 million. That means that belongs to the bands, it belongs to the food companies, the purveyors, the beer companies, the whatever. Yeah. All the lost income. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. I, and and I you know I feel a little bit now. I mean I'm 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 hearing it from everybody else. I mean we get the election over, maybe things will lighten up a little bit because right. now they're putting politics into everything. So yeah, they really are. I mean I'm going to tell you in 20 years of music writing um, and writing on covering all different kinds of people and things like that, it, it, it's it's to an artist that is a Birchmere artist that says they love playing there they love the people there they love the way you guys handle the business end of it the personal end of it i've told uh michael that and i've told um you guys that and i am telling you 
pandemic or not, the Birch Mirror will live on. And I, I'm, I, I can't wait to get the hell back out there, man, you know, yeah. and uh, you. run through the kitchen to find my seat. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but um, I don't know if that's going to happen again. I'll have to wear a mask. But, um, but anyway, um, you guys are real special to me and to the entire music community. And um, we wish you very good luck. I'll continue to promote. I've been promoting you guys since you opened on the show um, and uh, we'll continue to do it. But thank you for taking out some time and talking about uh, not only the current times, but what an amazing legacy uh, you've created, Gary, at the, the Birch Beer. And you too, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do it again. My pleasure. Let's do it yeah, again. Yeah, absolutely. When all this Thanks. is over with. Yeah. I'd like that. All right. Um, that's what I'm. That's what I'm talking to people. I'm like, you're coming back, and we're gonna really do it, and we'll, we'll all do it in person, hopefully, right, right there. But uh, best, be best to you both. Take care. All right. That'd be great. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, what a fabulous experience to to be with um, these two guys. Um, just you know, again, we, I, there is a family element. I see a little foggy in this on my camera, so I think I'll sit over here and let you see the birch mirror. Um, it, what an incredible experience to be able to talk to those guys about such a treasured venue. I uh, just loved every single minute of it. And hopefully um, the, the Birch Mirror will once again, soon, sooner than later, open up and we can um, have the amazing music again uh, with full crowds. Um, talking a little bit about what's coming up on Living on Music um, beginning this Monday is a guy who's going to be playing at the Birch Mirror on November 20th. And that is um, that is Bobby Thompson. And with a brand new self-titled record, um, Bobby is uh, really hitting all kinds of um, nuggets here. Um, it is um, a, a fabulous time for him. He's been doing some really neat stuff, kind of down in this basement looking for things um, and trying to, you know, kind of create music and, and stuff like that. So um, basically, um, we'll be talking about his career and his new records and things like that. So we'll have a, a wonderful time. But again, he's a, a Birch Mirror artist who will be playing there. Uh, come uh, the November 20th, as, as well as a lot of great artists who are trying to get back out on the road. Um, on November 2nd, very excited to have the head of School of Rock, Steve McKay, who is a, a drummer and a musician in his own right, but decided a, a number of years ago to um, pursue uh, his passion even further, and that is School of Rock. And so we will talk to um, Steve about School of Rock, about how they've been dealing with the pandemic, and um, getting through these these times uh, with students trying to you know learn music. Um, on November 9th, uh, Annie O'Neill joins me, and Annie is a fabulous singer songwriter from uh, out in the Washington State. Um, we talked today and had a wonderful chat about kind of what's going on with with her, and um, she's getting through this too. She's playing some amazing things, including a Jimi Hendrix 50th Memorial Weekend uh, gig out in Seattle outside. And she knows the Hendrix family. She's friends. Um, she's sung with Leon Hendrix, uh, Jimmy's brother, before. Um, she's been teaching with Tina Hendrix. Um, so it's, it's going to be a great talk. She's also going to play some of her own music with a couple of her band members. Really excited. That'll be November 9th with Annie O'Neill on Living on Music. Real quick on ZTV this week. Um, tomorrow night, Ra uh, Ralph Peluso interviews Paula Green. Um, who is the author of The Virginia Flood of 1870. And that's a pretty intense um, event that happened around here. And get ready for a pretty lively conversation with her. And also, uh, you can win a signed copy of the book if you answer some trivia questions uh, from Ralph. So that's tomorrow night at 7 on ZTV. Wednesday night at 7, debuting a new show. And that's Lauren Fisher of the Delray Wellness District. Lauren is going to be uh, doing Wellness Wednesdays and covering topics on health and wellness and so much more. Uh, so don't miss that episode um, uh, Wednesday at 7 and Thursday at 7. Get ready for another episode of Buzzworthy with our Queen Bay, Allison Preby. Uh, that's always a lot of fun on a Thursday night at 7. Uh, Real Quick Living on Music is a production of Zebra Press. The executive producer is David McClure. Uh, the press publisher is Mary Wadland. Uh, you can visit the zebra at zebra.org as well as on the Good News Zebra Facebook page. And also the uh, October 2020 edition of the Zebra newspaper. And that's a newspaper, people, also online at zebra.org. Uh, but you can also get a hard copy if you want by going to zebra.org and subscribing. Um, or you can pick it up at tons of locations around uh, Alexandria. I think there's 125 newspaper boxes, 400 bulk drop locations, things like that. Grocery stores, restaurants. If you're going out shopping safely, um, you, can you can find it uh, uh, in a lot of places out there. So... Please uh, support the zebra. Remember this Monday, uh, a week from tonight, um, I'm going to have the great Bobby Thompson on, and we'll be uh, we'll be going down some blues and folk uh, 
roads uh, next Monday night at seven. Once again, uh, take five minutes uh, if it, or take five days or five hours or whatever you can do to find someone. And remember to always be the good news in someone's life. Take care, y'all.